What's up, everybody? Welcome to your latest installment of Nuclear Barbarians. It is I, your nuclear barbarian, Emmett Penny, and I am here with Pat O'Brien, the one and only, let's see if I screw this up or not, Director of Government Affairs and Communications. Correct. All right, for Holtec. What is up, buddy? Glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, so where do I start with this? I mean, I want to know like your whole deal, but I want to like sort of clear the air here because this is obviously a podcast geared toward nuclear advocates. As nuclear advocates, we do everything we can to keep plants online. Plants get decommissioned. Whole tech does that. And I was like, you want to know what? Every time I feel too convinced of something, I need to f find a way to doubt myself and learn more about it. And I was like, the only way to do that is talk to a company that does that as part of their business. And we'll get into more of like what whole tech is up to, because I think it's a way bigger story than what we see as nuclear advocates. So I really want to thank you for taking time uh, to come on and talk to me about all this. Well, I think you're looking forward to it. Um, all right, cool. So before we get into any of that, though, uh, what's your deal, buddy? How'd you get here? That's a, good, that, that's a funny story and a long road. So, you know, I, I've grown up in Massachusetts. Um, I live in a community uh, that had a nuclear power plant growing up, but not part of my career path when I, when I started going. I went to, to undergrad at UMass Amherst um, as a history major, wanted to be a history teacher. And I, I tend to, to laugh when I tell the story, but halfway through my, my, uh, my sophomore year, I said, you know what? I don't, I'm not sure I can get up in front of a room full of people and talk all the time. I got <laughs> into politics, which is all I've literally done for the last 20 years is get up in front of people and talk. Um, you know, so much so that I'm here in Las Vegas for a conference and I'm speaking at the conference tomorrow in front of a room full of 300 people. So, whoa, kind of a fun, fun, uh, fun path. So, uh, I ended up uh, going to work, uh, at the state legislature in Massachusetts for, for five years and then did another eight years, uh, in local government in my hometown of Massachusetts that has the Pilgrim nuclear power plant. Uh, and then an opportunity opened up, um, from a former colleague that said, Hey, you want to come down and work at the nuclear plant? And my timing was impeccable. So I joined in like April of 2015. Uh, in September of 2015, the plant went into column four. So worst operational plant in the nation. And Oof. in October, they were shutting down in 2019. So my timing was spot on. I kind of looked at my and said, what did I do? Um, so I spent, you know, four years as the, as the senior comms guy, as company spokesperson uh, when we were operating and uh, made the decision, you know, towards the end to stay on uh, with the company that, uh, I had just found out about the year before um, that was going to decommission the plant. And, uh, you know, I've stayed on with Holtec for the last, geez, now four, four plus years mm. um, to kind of initially just do government affairs and communications for Massachusetts. Then I took over our whole uh, decommissioning fleet uh, as we've acquired more plants. I did kind of comms and government affairs for that. And then last October, I actually got the opportunity to take over uh, the entire company uh, for comms and government affairs. So. A little bigger responsibility, got to know more of our business. So, yeah, happy to kind of come on and, and talk about it because you're right. I mean, Holtec, you know, when it comes to decommissioning, it's really only a five-year, uh, the last five years as part of our business. Uh, but it's a 36-year-old company. So, much, much bigger story there. Uh, you know, we have a company that looks to help solve problems in the nuclear industry. And really what we're known for uh, it is wet fuel storage, so fuel uh, storage inside the spent fuel pools, the racking systems that mm. went into those. I mean, obviously, you know, and I think the audience is probably well aware of, um, you know, Yucca Mountain never came to fruition. Uh, these pools were designed to hold, you know, a certain amount of fuel uh, safely uh, without um, you know, some sort of uh, method to keep them um, subcritical. And, you know, what we looked at and did as a company and came up with the design for is those racking systems that, have allowed more fuel into the pools, keeping them subcritical. Um, and then kind of the natural progression from there was, okay, these pools are, are still getting um, full and there's still no repository. So uh, we're, we're also known for our dry fuel storage. We have about 70% of the world's business um, on dry wow. fuel storage. So uh, that's really what we're known for in the industry. Um, but that, again, is, it's just a piece of kind of how we view our business. I mean, I think a lot of people view us as a nuclear company. We view ourselves as a technology company. We're always trying to help solve the next issue. And that's really where decommissioning came in. We looked at it as, okay, we've safely, as, as a nation and an industry, we've safely built them. We've safely run them. 
Now we need to show that we can, you know, shut these down, return the sites to kind of pre plant conditions. Uh, let them be economic engines again for communities and, you know, kind of see what's next and what's next. Obviously I know we'll talk about it a little bit more is, you know, our kind of vision for, um, you know, the next generation of nuclear. Yeah, totally. So, okay. Let me, um, you know, cause I have to ask, I think i first of all, I think my listeners would get, uh, mad at me if I didn't, what the hell happened with Pilgrim? Uh, tell me a little bit about that backstory well, since you were there. So, towards the yeah. Year. So no, Pilgrim, Pilgrim was interesting. I mean, originally, uh, owned and operated by the local utility, which is Boston Edison was sold to Entergy in 1999 and Entergy ran it for, you know, 20 years and really, you know, Entergy as a, as a company made a decision to get out of the wholesale, um, you know, non-regulated nuclear mm -hmm. energy markets with their nuclear plants. So Pilgrim, Vermont Yankee, Indian Point, Palisades were all the northern plants that they owned that um, they looked at and said, you know, it's not it's not part of our business model anymore. Um, you know, uh, we'll look to see what we can do with those assets. One instance, uh, Fitzpatrick, um, they were able to sell that plant off and keep it running. Um, mm -hmm. Indian Point was a negotiated shutdown with the state of New York. Um, their license. Totally separate thing. We know that story. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Pilgrim really, you know, kind of same thing. You know, I think there was some hope at some point, you know, maybe someone would, would do something similar with, with Pilgrim that was done at Fitzpatrick, but, uh, you know, someone never, you know, uh, no buyer for that, uh, continued operations kind of came in. Uh, mm. so, you know, we went down the path to, to shut down and, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, having worked there for, for as long as I have, um, you know, it was a lot, it was a source of pride at the end and how, how the plant, um, you know, operated. Yeah. We were in column four, you know, in the NRC's, uh, you know, matrix, but we were able to, to drive and change culture the last couple of years, even in the situation where knowing we were shutting down, we were able to get back to column one status, which, you know, wow. the industry is not two months before we shut down. So I kind of talked to the pride and the culture of the people, um, and, and it was a real, um, you know, accomplishment for the site. And unfortunately, you know, I think there was some short-sightedness, uh, you know, from policymakers on what the value of Pilgrim was to the state of Massachusetts and the New England grid as a whole. Um, so you've really seen that shutdown be backfilled by gas. Um, yeah. As <laughs> usual. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, but, you know, you know, we're looking at our project and, and Pilgrim's, you know, coming along from a decommissioning perspective mm -hmm. where it was just four years ago. Last week we shut down. It was the thirty first of, of May, twenty nineteen. The plant shut, uh, and we've been we've been moving along. Uh, really, all that's left on the site uh, from a you know a, a nuclear footprint is the uh, the reactor building, turbine building. All the outbuildings have been removed. There's one wow. of office buildings. All the spent fuel's been stored. Uh, actually, since twenty end of twenty twenty one, we uh, we were able to get all the spent fuel pool safely managed in, in, not, in under two and a half, half years, which is a uh, was a world, I think it still is a world record for a, for a, a plant. So, it, you know, that project's going, there's, there's been some challenges. Um, most of those are, um, you know, from a, a state or a regulatory perspective, um, you know, the biggest one that it started at Pilgrim, it's headed to Indian Point, And, you know, I'm worried that it could, you know, kind of engulf the industry is, um, you know, treating and releasing wastewater from facilities uh, that mm -hmm. have, have low levels of tritium. It's been a big newsmaker in Massachusetts. It's become a very big newsmaker in Indian Point. Um, and I think you saw with a uh, different situation, though, um, out at Monticello in Michigan when they had an unplanned release of some, some tritiated water. So it's, it's become something in the industry that uh, I'll say the, the opposition groups have jumped on. They've used it to raise, uh, you know, funds and, and push back on, on the safety and, and the, uh, you know, the robustness of the industry. Yeah, I mean, you know, you'd have to chug a gallon of it to get the same exposure as like eating a banana, you know. But like, you know, that's you know, okay. I mean, they've been doing that for years. You know, that's their that's their mo. They're always going to capitalize on that. And um, you know, it's funny when we were setting this up, you called me from Pilgrim, and I remember being like, "Did you just call me from a nuclear plant?" Because in my mind, it was like decommissioned. I was like, "What is there like just a phone in a field, and this guy's calling me?" Uh <laughs> You know, so, a lot, a yeah, lot's gone. <laughs> yeah, gone. Okay, so this is good. We have some more clarity now. Well, this is sort of the perfect pivot because you brought it up. Let's talk about Palisades because here I think we have two different aspects of whole text business converging. Um, part of it was the acquisition of the plant for decommissioning and then the surprising 
move to say, no, we want to keep it running. And not only do we want to keep it running, we want to debut some other stuff we have in the works for nuclear reactors. So why don't you walk me through what's going on with Palisades? Because there, it's like we've had a lot of turnovers on downs here <laughs> with this one. I hope it is interesting. So, you know, previously, again, owned by Entergy, um, you know, late in the game, you know, similar, you know, Pilgrim had been, you know, in an out shutdown for four years. Palisades was the same kind of timeline uh, that this plant was shutting down, you know, at a certain date. So, um, Holt, I could look to acquire it for decommissioning. And, and, and you know, kind of at the last minute, the governor uh, of, of Michigan, um, you know, some federal officials said, hey, you know, would you guys consider keeping that plant open? And, you know, understandably, Entergy's business was business model was to exit that that market, so they weren't, um, you know, they weren't willing to, but they were willing to listen and, and, and help work, you know, kind of through the process and, and let us listen. Uh, and really, you know, that's what we said. We said, hey, you know, we'll 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 work with you. We'll listen. We'll see what what's available. And I think, you know, really the change, you know, kind of the sea change came from the federal government level with some of this money that's been available mm -hmm. uh, for nuclear plants. And in our initial um, you know, kind of thought was, well, we can, you know, acquire it for decommissioning. We can do some of the modifications um, necessary that would need to happen in decommissioning, but they're reversible. So, you know, you have the opportunity that should the opportunity arise to restart and repower that plant, um, it's not out of the realm of possibilities. So um, that's kind of the eye we went into decommissioning with. Um, and you know, kind of the parallel path to that. So we acquired it in June of last year. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was July of last year. I put an application to the civil nuclear credit program um, to see if it was viable to repower the plant. Um, you know, unfortunately, how that was written at the time um, kind of didn't fit with Palisade's situation. We were, we were shut down already. Um, yeah. And it, as everyone probably knows, obviously, uh, uh, Diablo uh, did get the first successful award uh, from that program, um, and then subsequently they they kind of revamped that program and um, made some 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 tweaks that would have allowed Palisades to be um, you know uh, uh, eligible for uh, the mm -hmm. monies from that program. But in the interim, we kind of looked at it and, and continued to talk with DOE about. You know, what other opportunities, what other sources of funding might there be that might make sense? And uh, really, the reality of it is we looked at um, the DOE loan program as something mm -hmm. that made a lot more sense from our perspective for, um, you know, the structure of what we need to do to, to repower the plant. Uh, so we applied for that, um, and that's still ongoing. Um, you know, we would hope to know, uh, you know, sometime in the fall this year uh, whether that funding is going to be available, and then that really would be the kind of that, go, no, go point on a restart. That's a very high level, easy, easy way of looking at it. That made it sound very simple. Like, oh, we'll get that and go. There's a lot more behind the scenes, obviously. Um, you know, we've worked uh, very closely with, uh, you know, state and local uh, elected officials. Um, the state um, just to put together a nuclear caucus. They've been very um, pro uh, Palisades uh, repower. Um, and they're looking at, you know, potential, uh, grants opportunities the state um, might be willing to, and then really you run into the kind of, kind of the uh, the other elephants in the room, um, you know NRC working with the NRC to go back through the process to um, to take off the restrictions that we have on the license um, since shutdown. Uh, we would look to get a power purchase agreement. You know you need to sell the power somewhere. So yeah, that's right. Pretty big piece. Uh, we need to find uh, and partner with an operator. Uh, you know obviously Holtec. You know, as I mentioned, you know, different parts of our business, but uh, had not been an operator uh, of a nuclear power plant that's running. So we'll look to par partner with someone that, that is in the industry. Uh, and then really, I'll say kind of, you know, the, the big thing, my opinion, would be, you know, bringing back the workforce. Um, you know, yeah. when is running, you're at almost 600 people. Uh, there's about 220 there today. So, you know, pretty significant, um, you know, effort would be needed to bring back you know, potentially people that retired or went into other industries uh, or just train a new workforce, um, you know, that, you know, hopefully can help run that plan for, you know, uh, years to come. So, you know, a lot of moving parts, moving pieces. Um, yeah. You know, we're optimistic. Um, you know, I've said in a number of interviews, well, it's something that's never happened in the industry before. And technically I'm right when I say it that way. It's, you know, no one's ever shut down a plant to decommission it 
and then repower. But Correct. there have been instances in the industry of plants shutting down for prolonged outages, you know, multiple years to um, kind of go and reassess and, and, and work through whatever issue may have been at that particular facility. So it's not unheard of to restart a plant that had been kind of in, in a, uh, in, you know, in a dormant state for a little while. So, you know, something we'll look at. And then, you know, once we have that kind of personnel piece, there's a, there's obviously going to be a big effort to uh, go back through all the systems, uh, ensure that, you know, preventative maintenance, required maintenance is done and kind of get the plant back into a um, um, position to, you know, effectively run for the long term uh, and provide clean power. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's really helpful because it helps people see like sort of all the different layers of governmental work that needs to be done, you know, um, the coalitions that need to be built, but also like just what it takes to run a plant and sell its power. The PPA thing, I think, is very, very fascinating. Um, I don't know how much you can talk about it, but I do know that I've had several conversations with people uh, who are interested in nuclear or uh, whatever, and they're like, I'm looking at strictly behind the meter stuff at this point because our power markets are so complex and so ungenerous to baseload power sometimes that uh, that's what they're looking at. Is Holtec looking at a variety of PPA options at this point? Are you guys not even there yet? Like, what's going on? But, um, can you not talk about it? Because that's fine, yeah, too. I can't, talk, I can't talk about it, too. Very much. fair. Um, that's fair. Just, you know, just, just looking for, you know, a PPA that will work and allow for uh, the plant to, to operate again, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, baseline. That makes total sense. Um, okay, so... This is what I heard. I don't know if it's right. And so you can set the record straight because this is sort of the next thing that I kind of want to talk about with you is that um, I also heard that uh, Holtec might be interested in debuting uh, its own reactor design at the Palisade site, which I imagine like most nuclear plants does not have its full reactor set and so could afford to site more reactors there. Um, of course, this would be after all the whole rigmarole we just decided, but did I hear that correctly? Um, yeah, that's been that's been mentioned as as an opportunity. Obviously, very pro uh, nuclear area, pro nuclear state. Uh, you know, it's something we'd consider. Uh, you know, with our small modular reactor uh, design, we have what's what we call the SMR one hundred and sixty, one hundred and sixty megawatt uh, reactor, pressurized water reactor. Um, it is something that we'll consider. Um, you know, should Palisades reopen, it's also something we'll consider. Should you know we not be successful. You know, it, it's a, it would be a good site for us to potentially debut that, and and you know where we are in the process with with our um, our uh, SMR. You know, you're looking at probably a deployment date in the early 2030s. So there's still some time uh, to work through that process. Obviously, for our design with the NRC, all the licensing at a federal, state, local level that might be necessary uh, to work through. Um, so you know. I'm excited for the industry because, you know, we have our uh, small modular reactor, but there's a number of different designs out there. And that's really where I think we see the industry headed, um, you know, long term. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how many more you're going to see of the big vogels that just got built mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and take a long time to get through that process. You know, where if you can get a lot of these designs, you know, approved and through the, uh, the analysis by the NRC, um, you know, these will be much more easily deployable um, and, you know, in a way that, you could cite two or three, you know, on the same um, footprint to allow for, um, you know, kind of something similar to what you have with some of these older plants that have, you know, uh, 800,000 megawatt uh, capacities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's interesting just how many different new advanced reactor types are going on. Why don't, why don't you walk me through what yours is a little bit and like what sets it apart from New Scale or Oaklo or Kairos or any of these other companies because yeah. everybody has their own flavor, you know? It's very true. And, you know, I, I was at the, the uh, Nuclear Energy Assembly at DC a few weeks ago and to hear the, all the different designs and, and ideas and, and where everyone is in the process was, was very fascinating to me because obviously I've really been focused on ours. Um, you know, it's it's funny, you know, sometimes, in, in, you know, tried and true is the best, you know, in my mm -hmm. mind sometimes. So that's really where our where our design is. I mean, it's a, it's a small modular, but it's a reactor, but it's just a pressurized wa water reactor, you know, similar to your Indian Points, your Palisades. Um, 
you know, it, it's kind of got a unique design. It, it doesn't rely on pumps or motors to remove heat. Um, so mm. it's, it's uh, you know, it's we consider it walk away safe um, and secure and it's easily deployable. So it's deployable in places where it's dry and you don't have that water source. And then it's obviously uh, deployable in kind of your typical, uh, what I would say, nuclear footprint area, you know, near a body of water. Um, right. So, you know, we designed it for, you know, 160 megawatts, um, you know, an 80 year uh, design life. Um, so in a, in a two year fuel cycle. So it's, it's very similar in that sense to kind of what the industry understands uh, and knows. So, you know, really where we are, um, you know, from a, from a timeline perspective, we, we would hope to have, um, you know, kind of commercial operations in the 2031, 2032 time range. Um, but we're, we've done a lot of pre-application work with the, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission kind of talking through, you know, what our design is, uh, you know, our understanding of uh, what they need before we put in an application for, for mm -hmm. review, um, you know, to support construction permit application. So uh, we found a lot of success in that. And I think we could do, um, you know, a two-part or a one-part um, uh, application, depending on, you know, kind of where we see it going. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be a little bit of work, obviously, you know, we've been working on it for over a decade. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, we feel like we're going in the right direction and, and we're getting there. Um, but you know, still, still a little bit of work to do, um, before everything formally goes into the NRC. Yeah. So well, let me ask you a little bit more about that because I think this is the first time I've, uh, interviewed somebody that works for a company that's in the process of, um, engaging with, uh, the regulators. I mean, I've talked to ONG guys and we've talked about their relationship with the EPA and how that works, but uh, the NRC is its own animal. Yep. Um, so j let me just ask you the big dumb question. Uh, what's it like? What, what do the steps look like? Uh, how demanding is the process uh, from your perspective? Like, just give me the general vibe here. Yeah, you know, I think from a vibe perspective, I think it's been very good. You know, we have a very good regu regulatory affairs team. Um, that has worked with the NRC in various roles over the years. Um, they know them well. They know what they want to see and what they want to hear. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're not, they're not afraid to, you know, to do the work, to have them, um, you know, review kind of pre-application stuff and then ask the questions. And, and that stuff's actually all public, which is, it's kind of been cool. We've done some social posts on it, which, you know, I think to <laughs> the average person might be a little uh, nerdy and technical. <laughs> but to those of us in the nuclear industry, it is kind of exciting to kind of show you know, different meetings, different steps. Um, so what ends up happening is we'll have these type of public meetings, pre-application meetings, and the NRC will actually write up like a, a post-meeting uh, review and put those out publicly. So, you know, it's been good. It's 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 been an open dialogue. I think it's helped um, from our perspective, kind of potentially address things that, you know, should we have just put the application in, we would be addressing them at a different point in time. So it's much easier, you know, on our end to kind of um, create and bring them the right rock, you know, my, my term, bring them the right rock. You know, it's not go find me a rock. Bring it, <laughs> bring it to you. So I love that. I love that. That progress. Um, you know, I think it, it's, it's smoother in that sense. And, you know, and, 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 you know, we feel it's, it's, it's a good design. We feel it's deployable and, uh, you know, we really want to see it, um, succeed and, and help the industry, uh, going forward because, I mean, I've been in the nuclear industry almost a decade now, and if you had told me when I started, I mean, obviously I talked about my timing and how, how uh, opportune it was to start a plant that was shutting down, um, that we'd be talking about um, not only trying to repower a plant that had shut down for decommissioning, but you're talking about, you know, trying to rebuild, I mean, trying to rebuild the industry with new gen technology and, and new deployment, I would have I laughed, you know. And yeah. Well, talk to me about that. What's that? So I, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not an old head in the pro nuclear space. There, there are people who've been here way longer and way stronger than me. You know, I didn't have to, didn't have to dig the wells that I drink from. Uh, but I have been in it for a minute now, and even in the time that I've been in it, uh, it has been remarkable. What's it been like to see these changes within the industry and? How is the industry talking about it amongst themselves? If you can give us a little insight yeah. into that. I think I'll answer the, the, the second question first, because yeah, I, you know, just coming off of the nuclear energy assembly that NEI puts on um, down at DC, there was an optimism that I hadn't seen in the industry in a long time. You know, it really was kind of excitement that there is so much progress. There is so much commitment, I think, 
um, at a federal and state level uh, from government to say, hey, nuclear is a valuable resource. You know, the, the, the example I use all the time is everyone wants to electrify everything. All right? We want to run on all electric cars and everything, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is fine, except that where's your power coming from? You know, people think about their power in the sense that I plug something in and it works. Mm -hmm. I plug it, it's not working, that's a problem. They don't think about the back end of where the power comes from. So, you know, to, to, to want to electrify, you know, the entire vehicle fleet in the country, you need a lot of baseload power and, and more yeah. than what wind and solar and even gas um, can, can, can bring to the, to, uh, you know, to the grid. So you really need reliable, uh, kind of safe, green, always on power um, that nuclear is um, to allow for that. So really the, that optimism, that, you know, kind of value that people are seeing in the industry that for years they really hadn't. I mean, I think, you know, at least when I initially got into the industry, nuclear was kind of viewed as, okay, Republicans are pro-nuclear, Democrats are, are against nuclear. Sure, um, yeah. And, and that was just kind of the mix. And, you know, coming from government, I kind of I kind of got that and understood, you know, kind of that was the playing field. And then, you know, you still see obviously a lot of pro-Republican support in nuclear, but you've really seen, you know, the Democratic side really look at it as, you know, a valued resource. Now, it's, in my opinion, um, regionalized. So you don't see that as yes. much. East. The Northeast, you know, you still have the advocacy groups that are that are opposed to nuclear um, that, you, you know, fought to close Pilgrim, that fought to close Indian Point, um, and that are still fighting along through the decommissioning process. So, you know, I, I don't see as much, you know, kind of change in that arena um, for, hey, we should be looking at, at nuclear as a, as a, as a reason. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some, you know, New Hampshire's got a, um, a working group right now that one of my colleagues spoke to a few weeks ago about our reactor design, um, that they're looking at, you know, what's potentially next for New Hampshire. Is there new nuclear available to New Hampshire? And, you know, they're, they have one of the two remaining nuclear plants in New England uh, with Seabrook still online and running, you mm -hmm. know, the megawatts there. So, you know, they look at it in one way. But then I just saw, you know, recently Maine had, had a bill that was proposed that look, would look at... Um, I guess the best way to put it would be floating nuclear. So, you know, put, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, on a, on a ship, you know, and, and, and do that. And then that, that failed. Um, uh, Connecticut's viewed, you know, obviously they saved Millstone. Uh, Millstone had been, you know, potentially mm -hmm. on the same path as Pilgrim. Um, so there was some incentives done there, but they're looking at potentially. They look aggressive pro nuclear now, all of a sudden, honestly, like I was reading some local press there and it, I was shocked. Like it, it wasn't just like, oh yeah, we're coming around to this. They're similar to Yunkin's push in Virginia. They were like, maybe this needs to be our next thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 it, and it's been fascinating to kind of watch. And you know, I'm kind of used to that in the southern plants. You know, having worked for Entergy, there's a lot of support in the south for nuclear. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I think I think the prime example is what we talked about a little bit, touched on a little bit earlier when I was talking about the, the credit program. Was, you know, the fact that California kind of reversed 180 and said okay we need to save diablo was was huge um not something i would have expected uh, yeah. to see in the industry five years ago um but i think once they realized the value and, and what what it brings to the to the to the state um and to the grid for security purposes because you know to me a lot of times you know you talk about you know one you know fuel source versus another you know from an environmental perspective from to, to me there's a big piece you know from a you know, national security perspective and, and yeah. an energy independence perspective. Um, you know, that to me, I, I think kind of gets short chain nuclear gets short shortchanged in. Um, you know, I remember, you know, going back through we were a pilgrim. Um, you know, we were we were trying to work with FERC back then to say, hey, you know, can we get, you know, considered for the winter reliability credits that a number of fuel sources get because Oh wow. I didn't know you guys applied for that or tried to. Looked at it because it was one of those things where you know, you're looking at what those are, and what those are is they give you incentive to have on-site fuel sources that are ready to go. And it's like, there's no more on-site fuel source ready to go than nuclear. It's there. It's in, yeah. And it it's two years. I mean, you know, what do you want? So, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, five years ago, that was the, you know, kind of the viewpoint of them at that point was now the nuclear didn't qualify. Now you've seen that sea change in the last five years. So. Now yeah, I think they burned enough oil to keep the yeah. lights on in New England yeah. to be like, you know what, uh, uh, we might want to rethink that. Which well, is, I, you know, I remember that right when we shut down. It was it was a bad winter after Pilgrim shut down. And yeah, it was the first first time I had seen it in a while watching the grid mix. It was heavy, heavy oil. It was a one seven day stretch 
where they in early January where they burned more oil than they had in the previous like two years combined. Yeah, it made up for during the cold snap over Christmas uh, a fifth of uh, generation in New England, which is wild. You know, that's a wild. That's like that's like pre OPEC oil crisis levels of oil on the grid. Like you, we just haven't seen that for a really long time, almost over half a century, basically. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah, it's good to see. I mean. You know, there are mixed feelings that I have as a nuclear advocate. On the one hand, you're still angry and bitter about, uh, I would say, like, a certain level of disingenuousness and politicking and, frankly, bullshit that led to the destruction of this industrial wealth. But, you know, you don't ever want to write anybody off. And ultimately, you want to see people come around. And you always want to have open arms for them to come around, you know? So I think... It's really important to celebrate people changing their minds and the sea change. And rather than do like I told you so or what took you so long to say like that doesn't matter. What matters is that we get on the same page as fast as possible today. And that seems more likely than ever. No, I, I, I agree with you 100 percent there. And I, I think a big piece of it, too. And, I, you know, having got into the industry when I did, you know, part of it was on the industry. I mean, we were kind of. Don't rock the boat mentality. Hey, we'll totally. Hum, yeah, well, we'll hum along in the background, be quiet, you know, which is fine um, until anything pops up. And obviously, you know, when, when you think about us as an industry, there's, you know, three events that come to people's minds. Um, but you know, <laughs> the, amount, the amount of power that was generated safely, um, you know, and the learning, uh, you know, kind of, I'll say the learning in the industry is unparalleled. The training in the industry is unparalleled. I mean, absolutely. I came from, I can't, like I said, I came from a government background. So I started to remember some of my first days in the plant and they're like, no, you got to hold the handrails. And I'm like laughing. I'm like, why do I have to hold the handrails? Like, that's safe. Like, you, you're, they're minute details down to safety. It was about you walking around the site. Don't talk on your cell phone, like little things like that. And then when you kind of look and extrapolate and see what that actually means at the larger level for, for protection and, and safety. It was amazing. Um, it, you know, the training piece just for an operator, um, I, I, I couldn't believe it when I actually understood it. And you know, I think one of the best things I did when I got into the industry um, was actually take the systems class for, for the plant. So the same class that, you know, the first two weeks an operator were spending, you know, in their two-year class. I got to take that, understand the plant, get tested on it, which I was like, oh, God, please pass. You know, I hadn't had a test since college. <laughs> So it was kind of kind of kind of interesting to understand, but you know, I saw that you know these guys who were on shift you know, every sixth week. So you know, whatever your 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 shift work is for for the first five weeks, your sixth week, you're in the classroom for the entire week. You have to pass that test at the end of the week, and if you don't, you're not on shift again. Um, and they would train, you know, going over to the simulators at these these sites, seeing them train on a replica control room. You know, scenarios that have happened at all the plants, you know, worst case scenarios in the industry. How would you do this or that? Um, and being able to run those scenarios and having them learn in real time um, and, and then critique and, and, you know, fine tune, you know, what occurs was just amazing to me. Because it's not something that, you know, you see in any really any other industry. I mean, the only other industry to me that's close and, you know, when it comes to training scenarios, I don't even think it is that close to the airline industry. And you have pilots, yeah. right? You know, there's a lot of training. There's a lot of you know uh, things that go into that. But I still think you know from a from a from a training perspective, you know, no one's more highly trained than the operators. Yeah, so. absolutely agree. Um, and I very much agree on uh, difficulties the industry has had in advocating for itself um, and in communicating its value to the public. Um, and I hope that that is uh, beginning to change because I think that. Um, you know, people, if you live in a deregulated or restructured area like I do, uh, every once in a while you'll get a piece of mail that's like trying to sell you some CCA stuff like that. Most people don't even know what a kilowatt is. So they're looking at this and they're like, what the hell is this even? And they're like, I don't know. I see a wind turbine on it. I'm signing it. They say they're going to give me a deal. And who knows if that's true? And I'm not knocking anybody because I did not come from a background where I would know anything about this. I'm deeply sympathetic to that. So I think that, um, you know, with this increase in optimism, I think it is hopefully safer for nuclear uh, as an industry to be more outward facing in terms of the value they bring, their culture of safety. And I think the general values of the industry are sound. 
you know, like I was, uh, I was just turned in a piece uh, to a magazine yesterday called Ancient Earth Nuclear, where I talk about at the end of the piece, the functional immortality, perhaps of nuclear, like we don't know yet. But like the idea that you have this culture embedded in an industry where you can potentially keep refurbishing these things on the future, provided we want them. And it um, seems like we're going to need energy in the future. You know, um, I think that that is a level of foresight, dedication, focus, and commitment that seems absent in a lot of other domains in our culture, not just our industry. And I think that's really inspiring. I think that'll really resonate with people. It makes a lot of sense, too. And I think one of the things, you know, the industry has tried to do, but, you know, I still think, you know, it, it's a struggle to get your side of the message out. Totally. You know, you hear, oh, it's a 60-year-old plan. It's a 50-year-old plan. It's this, it's that. Yeah, it's it's, it's a 60-year-old plan in the same way that that, you know, 67 Mustang is a, you know, I'm a 60-year-old car. It's <laughs> it still it, rules. It, 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 it must be like still it, cool yeah, as well, hell. I, you know, I, it looks like it on the outside, but the work done inside it can be completely, uh, mm -hmm. you know, new parts, you know, whatever you need along the way. You do that preventative maintenance. You do all that. So, yeah, the body is one thing, but the parts on the inside have, have been refurbished, excuse me, to a point where, you know, it's still viable. And then I think the other piece, you know, kind of where you were just going with this, you know, you hear a lot about the nuclear waste problem. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's only a problem because... We choose, I think, as a as a country to not kind of take it head on. You know, do you want to uh, solve it? Do you want to find a permanent repository for it? You know, and is the best use right now taking that as it sits at every plant in the site, I mean, in the nation, and putting it into a permanent repository? Or should we be looking at what France does in reprocessing the fuel? Because and you have these fuel assemblies that still have 90 to 95% of their, their usable power in, in, mm -hmm. in, these, uh, in these fuel pellets. You know, do you go through the process to extract that and then reuse that power? And, and you have generations of power still available in there. And it's totally has been done, um, you know, really since pre-Carter administration. That's really kind of where reprocessing stops. So late 70s before I was even born. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, kind of where are we want, where do we want to go as a nation? Where do we want to look at, um, you know, and I know that some of these, some of these um, reactor designs, you know, the, the kind of the next gen reactor designs are looking at, you know, can we use spent fuel in these assemblies in our reactors? So totally, there's, there's that option that, that people are starting to think outside the box that it's only a problem because we don't want to address it. Yeah, no, totally. And I think, you know, um, uh, uh, earlier this year, even AOC was praising France's reprocessing. Yeah, you're going um, over to Fukushima, which, you know, that, that says a lot to me that if you, if you go there and get yourself educated, you kind of start to learn and understand. Exactly, exactly. So I think, you know, that tells me that there's potential for a broad coalition uh, who's willing to try to find these solutions. You know, maybe we'll see breeders back on the table. Like, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think that uh, the, we have potential for the conversation to really change around nuclear. So, totally. And I think it's not in Arkansas. Arkansas passed the bill this year, um, which to me I thought was kind of unheard of, where they're like, we want to be the spot to reprocess and, and house you know, yeah. and fuel um, for that next generation, which I thought was kind of really interesting. Um, you know, I've tried to reach out and, and still, uh, you know, owe a phone call to the representative that put that bill forward because i just really kind of want to understand it from a nuclear perspective of you know what are you guys looking to do down there because um you know they're obviously arkansas pro nuclear you know having been an energy employee they have a and o down there um mm -hmm. that provides them a ton of, of clean power so you know they definitely know what they're talking about when it comes to nuclear so it'll be interesting to see kind of where that all, all plays out no absolutely absolutely and we now we have all these uh these moratoria being lifted on nuclear a lot of which were sort of uh de facto moratoria premised around waste handling. Um, yeah. You know, California is sort of the white whale of that. Like if California ever reverses that, like that's when you know it's really changed. You oh, know, yeah. you know? <laughs> that would be, that'd be like a huge, you know, like you would really like the boardroom of the Sierra Club would be reduced to tears like immediately <laughs> if that happened, you know? Um, so, but that feels like, hey, that might be in the running now. So, let me let me sort of like change tracks here and ask you more generally. You know, you've talked about how Holtec is like 
is it's a technology company. What haven't we talked about that you're excited about with whole tech right now? You know, I, I'm just excited about kind of, you know, what the future is going to hold. I mean, the company, mm. you know, has been built for the last 36 years. You know, it started with our, our founder, um, Dr. Chris Singh, uh, who really, you know, is, is a fascinating individual, uh, has always, you know, from, from what I've gotten to know of him, has, has kind of always just muted his art. What's, what's the next challenge? What's the next issue? Mm. I mean, for, for him to, you know, have this, you know, very steady, very secure, um, spend fuel business. You know, we do heat exchangers as well. Um, you know, kind of the beginning of our, our business model that was, you know, heat exchangers and then into the spent fuel industry, you know, for him to look at opportunities like decommissioning where he is in his career and say, this is the next thing I want to tackle. And then for him to look at small modular reactors and say, yeah, oh, this is still something that I think, you know, needs to be done and to, um, you know, for us, you know, it's a privately held company to, to finance all that on our own um, and, and spend the money, you know, spend the capital uh, to, to run these programs. And, and, you know, knowing that the payoff's not going to be for, you know, years, if not decades down the line when it comes to S SMR, you know, it's really a credit, uh, you know, to kind of the culture of the company uh, and how we see, um, you know, the industry changing. So you know, I'm excited from, from that perspective. Uh, we have a lot of really good people working here um, that, you know, want to do the right thing every day and want to help, you know, what, you know, what, what the future looks like for, for energy. So, um, it's amazing to me, um, you know, at some point above, you know, come down and tour our camping facility. It's, Oh, totally. I'd love to. It's one thing that's really cool. Like, you know, I'll say, you think about companies now and, you know, everything, almost everything's manufactured overseas. There's not a lot of, um, mm -hmm. you know, production in the U S and, and, you know, to Dr. Singh's credit, all of our stuff's uh, manufactured in the U.S. We have oh, that's awesome. Facility uh, in Cameron, New Jersey, that's does a lot of our spent fuel, um, you know, canisters. It's also set up for you know when when the time comes, you know, to do some some SMR work there. Um, but then we have a, a facility outside of Pittsburgh and a facility outside of uh, or in Orville, in Ohio. So you know, 1.2 million square feet of of shop space in the United States, and we ship everything, you know, internationally. And we're in 14 countries. You know, we're we're in um, you know, constantly working overseas to, to expand the business um, and, uh, you know, continue to grow uh, as, as a business, you know, that's been very successful for the last 36 years. That's awesome. I love that. I love that it's made it in the U.S. I would be, of course, honored to come tour uh, the campus at some point. We'll have to talk about that. Um, and I think this is a great place to wrap it up on a really hopeful note. So, Pat, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate you making the time. No, this is great. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed it. All right. Glad to hear it. All right, everybody. Remember, stay sharp, stay strong, and stay radiant. We will see you next time.